Um, I'd like to welcome all of you to this um, webinar series, and we'd like to thank Jafron for um, arranging all of this. And uh, tonight, we have uh, very uh, distinguished speakers to share with us their experience. Um, firstly, I will give a talk on hemoperfusion in multi-organ failure um, due to severe leptospirosis which is a devastating disease that we get in the Philippines during the rainy season. And um, after me, uh, we will have a talk by Dr. Liang Yu on hemoperfusion, a promising therapy in improving the overall outcomes of COVID-19 in the critically ill patient. And then we have uh, Professor Erdal Kurtoglu, who will uh, discuss with us the usage of the HA330 or sepsis column in ICU again for COVID-19. So uh, we'll start. So I hope you can see my slides. So Um, here we are. This is a picture of my center, the National Kidney and Transplant Institute. It's in Quezon City in the Philippines. And we have a 380-bed uh, uh, public hospital specializing in renal, urology, vascular diseases, and organ uh, and cellular transplantation. The sorbent cartridges became available in the Philippines in 2018. And since then, we've been able to use uh, these cartridges. Leptospirosis is a very severe disease that we get um, during the rainy season, and it results upon exposure of mucous membranes to the urine of infected animals, usually rats in urban cities. And the most severe complication is Wilde's disease, where you have jaundice, renal failure, and pulmonary hemorrhage. And this slide shows to us uh, that uh, in the year 2018, uh, we really had a surge of leptospirosis cases, as shown here. Um, the yellow line uh, looks at the five-year average. And you can see in 2018, over here, uh, you see uh, really a peak of the number of cases that occurred during that period. And here we go. Uh, it was so severe, we were admitting as much as like 15 to 20 patients every day uh, in patients with severe leptospirosis needing a, um, dialysis. And in fact, we had to convert uh, our gym into a ward for these uh, leptospirosis patients. And because uh, a lot of the patients were on hemodialysis, we even had to set up uh, hemodialysis machines right in that gym so that uh, they could easily be dialyzed. Um, as often as needed, and usually that would be daily. Now, leptospirosis uh, presenting with renal failure is often accompanied by pulmonary hemorrhage and carries a high mortality despite standard therapy. There's increasing evidence for an immunologic mechanism mediating both these complications. And because of that, we included in our protocol giving immunosuppression consisting of methylprednisolone IV pulses and IV cyclophosphamide. And we uh, started this as part of our treatment protocol since 2014 to improve overall outcome. In a review of 194 patients that we treated from 2014 to 2016, uh, we had 25% of our patients who died. And they died because of lung hemorrhage and sepsis. 16% had pulmonary hemorrhage. And among these patients with pulmonary hemorrhage, 65% of them would die. And 7% uh, uh, died because of multiple organ failure. So the significant predictors of mortality in this set of patients were a low platelet count, prolonged prothrombin time, and parenchymal infiltrates on the chest X-ray. The parenchymal infiltrates on chest X-ray uh, was probably uh, evidence of the pulmonary hemorrhage. If we recall, uh, the inflammatory mechanisms in sepsis were very familiar. 
uh, with what happens when you have tissue injury from um, severe infection or other complications such as pancreatitis or surgery. We have uh, the release of PAMPs, our pathogen-associated molecular pattern, and our DAMPs, which are our damage-associated molecular pattern. And this results in um, inflammatory cascade, so-called cytokine storm, and this leads to our tissue organ damage. And this is a cycle that uh, continues. When we look at the cytokine storm, which is found in sepsis, we can see that the very important is the time element as shown in this slide. We have here on the x-axis time and here on the y-axis the immune response behavior. And um, the time when there is a rise in our pro-inflammatory arm as reflected by this uh, red line, you see that this is where we would like to be able to remove the cytokines when you have the peak of our pro-inflammatory cytokines being released. If we go too late over here, we find that the pro-inflammatory cytokines are decreasing and there is already an increase of our anti-inflammatory arm, which is helpful. So the time element of when we start this treatment to remove these cytokines has to be as much as possible as when the cytokines are at their peak so that we can remove the ill effects from uh, this cytokine storm. It's too early when the cytokines are very low, we're doing it too late when the anti-inflammatory cytokines, which would be helpful, is increasing, would um, not be very good for the patient. So really the key element is to determine when that peak occurs. Now, uh, in our patients with leptospirosis, we found that renal function recovered within two days of treatment. That is, we uh, gave our dialysis therapy, our pulse immunosuppression, antibiotics, and supportive care, uh, regardless of mortality. So our patients, at least the acute kidney injury, will improve. Causes of death were pulmonary hemorrhage and sepsis. For pulmonary hemorrhage, we start our patients on ECMO for lung support. But for sepsis, it's a question mark. What can we do for the patients who are developing sepsis uh, because of this um, devastating disease? What are the therapies available to us? In order to remove fluids or acids and waste products, we have renal replacement therapy. And uh, the mechanism is through diffusion and convection to remove uh, all of these um, uh, causes of uh, acute kidney injury. On the other hand, we now have therapy available to remove pro-inflammatory cytokines such as IL-1, IL-6, TNF-alpha, and other mediators. And we do this through hemoperfusion or coupled plasma filtration absorption. And the mechanism of this is now adsorption. So we have these therapies available today. So in 2018, in order to address these concerns, these main um, causes of uh, mortality in our patients, if the patient developed pulmonary hemorrhage, we put them on ECMO. And if the patient has severe sepsis uh, manifested by um, a drop in their blood pressure, cardiovascular collapse, then we put the patients on hemoperfusion um, aside from renal replacement therapy. What were the outcomes of our patients? In 2018, we had a total of 436 patients diagnosed with leptospirosis, and our overall mortality was 15%, and the most common cause of death was pulmonary hemorrhage. Remember that initially we had a mortality of uh, 25%, so we were able to bring that down, and those patients with pulmonary hemorrhage, where 65% of them were dying, we were now able to save these patients. We present data now on 20 patients, uh, given our standard protocol, ECMO for lung hemorrhage and respiratory failure despite maximum ventilatory support, and hemoperfusion or DP mass as indicated. And we were able to, to have that uh, published 
at the BMJ case report as a case of lepto with acute respiratory failure and, kid, and acute kidney injury treated with simultaneous ECMO and hemoperfusion. So here was how we managed the patient. So they were in ICU. We had our ECMO access. Five had a femoral, femoral line, while two had a femoral jugular line. Our hemodialysis, CRRT, and hemoperfusion access was an IJ triple lumen catheter. We gave our methylprednisolone pulses and an IV cyclophosphamide dose. We also uh, managed the patients with triple sedation, anticoagulation with heparin, despite patients being uh, presenting with pulmonary hemorrhage, tightly controlled by measuring our uh, coagulation uh, parameters and uh, transfusion of various blood products. For CRRT with hemoperfusion, we used the HA330 sepsis cartridge. Uh, we did CVVH, um, and these were the parameters we used. Patient was uh, on systemic anti anticoagulation for ECMO, so we needed no other anticoagulation during um, CRRT. Uh, fluid removal was done as required. And we continued CRRT until BP normalized and the patient was off inotropes. Then uh, the patients were shifted to SLED. Uh, we did HP using the HA330 once a day for three days. In some patients, we had to do a fourth or fifth um, dose of hemoperfusion if the HSCRP was increased. So we also did our, our SOFA scores, HSCRP, and procalcitonin daily. In our institution, we do not have uh, um, labs to measure our cytokines. So we, uh, in place of that, we would uh, use HSCRP uh, and procalcitonin to see uh, which would uh, be a better parameter um, to measure our cytokine storm. So among our 20 patients, mean age was about 33. These were young patients who develop uh, this disease. A uh, male's uh, ratio of uh, six is to one. The mean creatinine was 7.6. Procalcitonin levels were elevated at 61. HSCRP, our mean was 171. Our Apache scores on baseline were, was 20. And SOFA scores at baseline was 16. So these patients were really very, very ill, um, requiring uh, dialysis therapy. Uh, here we see uh, our SOFA scores as we did our hemoperfusion. And you can see um, that SOFA started with a mean at 15 and uh, it significantly dropped to 12 uh, after the third um, hemoperfusion um, dose. Our procalcitonin here, uh, we see a baseline of about 60. It increased a bit from the first and second um, hemoperfusion. But by the third, it significantly decreased um, to about 10. Looking at our HSCRP, uh, it still remained elevated. We need also to realize that the patients also had a lot of other infections simultaneously, uh, which probably uh, also um, uh, caused uh, the CRP to remain elevated. HSCRP and procalcitonin uh, for us Procalcitonin better uh, was a better uh, marker to look at the, the effect of uh, our uh, hemoperfusion. We also noted that the mean inotropic requirements decreased after every hemoperfusion. So our patients um, were on tr usually triple inotropes, norepinephrine, dopamine, and dobutamine. You can see here that after the second hemoperfusion, we were able to discontinue norepinephrine and dopamine. And by the third, we were um, also able to remove dobutamine, although in some, uh, they still required a little norepinephrine. So we had a 30% mortality, 6 out of 20, among patients with pulmonary hemorrhage and uh, who were dialysis dependent from their AKI. We found that our SOFA score significantly decreased by the third hemoperfusion, as did procalcitonin. And we were also able to um, uh, taper off our inotropes, uh, usually even by the first uh, hemoperfusion. We found this to be very helpful because as we were able to remove the inotropes, um, uh, probably because of removal of a sufficient um, quantity of cytokines, 
we were better able to dialyze the patients uh, with CRRT. So that was, uh, very useful because if the patient's blood pressure uh, is very low, we sometimes cannot even start them on renal repayment therapy. So conclusions from this small study was that hemoperfusion on patients with severe leptospirosis with renal failure and pulmonary hemorrhage is a useful method to support the management of AI critically ill patients, and that the sepsis cartridge, the HA330, was useful to prevent complications in these patients with multi-organ failure. I would also like to share with you very briefly some of the COVID confirmed cases that we were able to treat in our hospital um, since March. This was our uh, hemoperfusion protocol for COVID suspects using the HA330. Uh, we did it for patients with severe or critical vital signs as shown here. So usually patients were hypotensive, tachycardic, akipnic, and their O2 sat was less than 92% per, at room air, or maybe more than 92%, but the patient was in respiratory distress or with impending um, organ failure. So we reserved it for those who were really very uh, ill. Aside from that, we also um, looked at the chest X-ray. So if the X-ray showed multilobar or diffuse infiltrates, plus any one of these uh, inflammatory markers, such as an increasing ferritin, LDH, lymphopenia, high D-dimers, or increasing HSCRP, uh, these were indications for us that uh, we would start the patient on hemoperfusion or sometimes tocilizumab, which is also an IL-6 um, uh, a removal um, uh, treatment. Uh, so our patients, if they were lymphopenic, if their ferritins were more than 1,000, LDH more than 245, a high HSCRP, low or normal procalcitonin, since this was a measure more of uh, bacterial infection. And um, we also describe the X-ray parameters uh, of these patients. This was our protocol. We did um, HA330, day one. We tried to do two doses 12 hours apart, then a second and third dose one day apart. Uh, mostly our patients uh, are on dialysis since we are a kidney institute. So we usually get referrals of patients already on dialysis. I find that in a lot of the um, other uh, publications from uh, other countries that most of the patients they see develop AKI, but in most of our patients, uh, they were already on dialysis. So uh, we usually did the HP for three hours, uh, blood flow rates of 250, anticoagulated with low-dose heparin. Um, and for patients who were either not ESRD or patients on peritoneal dialysis, we would insert a central line. Uh, we would do daily uh, blood counts, uh, bilirubin and uh, liver uh, enzymes, a daily blood gas during uh, hemoperfusion. And after the third or fourth dose of hemoperfusion, then we would repeat our inflammatory markers. We did a daily x-ray while on hemoperfusion and our daily vital signs and oxygen saturation. So we did this already in five patients. Mean age was 60, uh, males more than females by four is to one. Um, all of our patients were on dialysis. Three were on hemodialysis and two were on peritoneal dialysis. Lymphocytes were low at 4.5. LDH was elevated at 452. Ferritins, uh, 1,771. HSCRP mean was 86. Procalcitonin mean was 3, elevated, but not as high as the other markers. And our D-dimer was also significantly elevated at 587. And this showed to us uh, how our patients did. In these five patients, we can see that HSCRP dropped by the fourth um, dose. Our ferritins also declined. Our lymphocytes recovered. They uh, started to increase from a mean of about 4 to about seven, still low, and our LDH uh, also declined. So we found that uh, at least uh, these inflammatory markers showed uh, that they were, uh, that they decreased you know, with our hemoperfusion. <clears throat> this is an example of a patient we did. 
70-year-old female with CKD um, stage 5 because of polycystic kidney disease uh, on hemodialysis. Her chief complaint was dyspnea. Uh, you can see that she had a very horrible x-ray of the right lung was almost um, not visible at baseline. On hospital day 7, uh, she was given tocilizumab and on hospital day 8, we started our hemoperfusion. Um, by uh, x-ray, uh, after the hypoperfusion and day two post tocilizumab, we can see some clearing of the x-ray. And here we see uh, by day nine post tocilizumab and after the fourth hypoperfusion, we have a uh, significant clearing of that right lung. This is another patient, a 64-year-old male, again, uh, on peritoneal dialysis. And look at that baseline, a chest x-ray showing all these reticular nodular um, um, infiltrates. Uh, Post-first hemoperfusion, uh, we see that there may be some improvement um, in that x-ray. Uh, these patients are alive um, out of the five patients. Uh, one out of five died, um, one uh, after the second hemoperfusion. None of the patients required intubation. None of the patients required inotropes. And our PF ratio for all the patients uh, was more than 300. For the patients who were able to tolerate it, they were also put on prone. So they would do prone uh, positioning twice a day for about four hours um, if they could tolerate it. So thank you very much. Uh, that's uh, the end of uh, my presentation. Uh, we'll reserve our um, discussion points later. I would now like to invite um, our next speaker. Our next speaker um, is Dr. Liang Yu. He is um, a physician of the Infectious uh, Disease Department of the First Hospital of Zhejiang Province in China specializing in the diagnosis and treatment of viral hepatitis and other infectious disease. We know that um, China was first hit by this uh, terrible disease, our COVID-19. So we really look forward to um, Dr. Yu's uh, talk on um, how they dealt with uh, the COVID-19 patients and uh, that it that a hemoperfusion, a promising therapy in improving overall outcomes of the COVID-19 critically ill patients. Um, Dr. Liang Yu. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Dangoria. Uh, let me first. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Yu from Hangzhou, uh, the first affiliated hospital of Zhejiang University. I really appreciate uh, have been invited to be here in this online webinar. Uh, in the past three months, I participated as a team member uh, in ICU to treat these critically ill COVID-19 patients in our province. And today I like to uh, introduce our experience of hemoperfusion therapy uh, in managing those patients. Uh, here, and here's my topic of these pre presentations. And my uh, email address is also here. If you're interested in uh, my study or anything, you can contact me later. Well, uh, uh, my speech contains four parts. Firstly, a brief introduction of COVID-19. Uh, as we already know, it's an ongoing pandemic disease which is named as Coronavirus Infected Disease 2019, short for COVID-19. It's a highly contagious disease caused by a newly emerged virus, but structurally and virologically similar to the severe adult respiratory uh, syndrome uh, coronavirus and was named as SARS coronavirus 2. Uh, symptoms caused uh, by this virus vary in different populations. Uh, commonly, nasal symptoms are rare. A majority of patients would experience fever, cough, fatigue, myalgia, uh, and some of them may have uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, 
diarrhea uh, and loss of appetite. And in some patients, it may present as conjunctivitis, or loss of taste to smell, and skin lesions in tongue and uh, finger. Uh, and here's a timeline flowchart for a progression of this pandemic. Uh, on December the 8th, in Wuhan, the capital city of Hubei province of China, a hospital identified the first case of pneumonia without, uh, with unknown etiology. And on December the uh, 31st, China reported to World Health Organization that there was clusters of these cases. Uh, and on January the 7th, the pathogen of this unknown pneumonia was identified as a novel coronavirus uh, on January the uh, 30th. Uh, WHO set a global alert, declare a public health emergency of international concern, and on March the 11th, uh, uh, declare as pandemic. Up to date, the confirmed COVID-19 patient exceeded 3 million. Since this the uh, rapid increase of newly confirmed cases and uh, absence of target or effective therapy, and no one can expect it. what will happen in the future. Uh, a large court study, including more than uh, uh, 44,000 COVID-19 patients from China, showed uh, the highest incidence rate in China is. Uh, in the patient age between 30 to 79 years old. Uh, severe and or critical ill was about 19%. Uh, mortality was about 2.3%. Uh, and in particular, the morbidity was about 4% in healthcare professionals. And this figure shows the mortality rate in 10 most affected countries by COVID-19. Uh, we, we can see here in, uh, in those developed countries uh, with a powerful medical system, there was still a very high mortality rate, uh, which is actually uh, similar to the situation in Wuhan city during the early epidemic. Uh, that, that means the case fatality rate of this disease can exceed more than 10% when medical resources could be well assessed, but insufficient to deal with such a medical burden. Uh, after a brief introduction, I will share with you some experience reported from China. Uh, China have a good experience in fighting this disease. Here, here we'll uh, discuss two experiences. The first one reported in the Zhejiang experience, uh, which included several key points of uh, disease management, uh, as for anti and to balance, as shown uh, in the graph data, uh, antivirus, anti shock, anti hypoxemia, anti secondary infection, and um, maintain the balance of water, electrolyte, and acid base, maintain the balance of microecology. Uh, Pretty like the sepsis, uh, shock and hypoxemia usually presented in a critically ill patient with COVID-19 and may progress due to uh, overreacted immune response, also known as cytokine storm. But the Zhejiang experience suggested to use the uh, artificial liver support system to perform, to perform multiple blood purification therapies including plasma exchange, uh, absorption, uh, hemoperfusion, and hemofiltration. Those therapies can effectively reduce the inflammatory mediators and prevent the incidence of shock, hypoxemia, and acute respiratory distress syndrome. As, uh, as we will know, multiple organ dysfunction may occur in some patient with COVID-19, especially the uh, acute liver injury and acute kidney injury, uh, which has been also reported as two major independent risk factors of death. And blood purification therapy using 
the uh, artificial liver support system were also able to provide serum albumin uh, coagulation factors and balance the systemic uh, fluid volume and to improve multiple organ functions. Uh, thus, uh, as a result, to reduce the mortality of severe patients. Uh, in the Chinese guideline for COVID-19 by uh, National Health Commission, the organ support, including respiratory support, uh, circulating support and blood purification were also mentioned as key uh, recommendations to, to regulate the immune system and to relieve the symptom in severe and critical patient. Uh, Here's the, three, the third part that I like to tell, uh, talk about something about the rationale of reusing blood purification. Uh, uh, that is based on the following theory and publication evidence. Uh, this figure from Harvard Medical School summarized the possible uh, mechanism of innate response in COVID-19 patients, which uh, demonstrated that viral replication may uh, directly trigger uh, hyperinflammatory condition and cytokine storm. Uh, this report uh, published in Lancet by Professor Cao Bing uh, also indicated the possible association of cytokine storm and the severity of this disease. And uh, this is an under-publication research paper uh, that demonstrated a significant uh, elevation of cytokines on severe COVID-19 patients and higher incidence rate of ARDS in the group of patients. And this uh, study published in JAMA International Medicine support a theory of cytokine storm in severe COVID-19 patients, especially the uh, elevated, elevated interleukin-6. In the study, patient uh, with COVID-19 pneumonia who had developed ARDS has had a significantly higher uh, neutrophil count than those without ARDS, uh, perhaps uh, leading to the activation of neutrophil to uh, execute an immune response against the virus, but also contributing to cytokine storm. Uh, this publication uh, is a comment from uh, Professor Renko, uh, pos uh, postulated that uh, after the viral infection, the systemic cytokine release is made related to the activation of the innate system by the a virus and to the mechanical ventilation associated lung injury and to the extracorporeal membrane oxygenation related injury. Uh, and this will induce uh, endothelial dysfunction and consequent organ failure. Uh, based on those evidence of cytokine storm and its possible mechanism on the progression and severity of COVID-19, uh, the National Health Commission of China recommended the blood purification therapy. Uh, and in Zhejiang experience, uh, also recommended to use uh, RT, uh, artificial liver support system or other blood purification devices to, uh, for severe and or critically ill patients, uh, uh, as just mentioned. For uh, for more details, uh, here, here at the bottom right of the slide is the download URL for the Handbook of Zhejiang Experience uh, with, with 22 languages. If you're interested, you can download here. Uh, in, in result to the uh, previous publication on uh, Jeffron cartridges, a HA type which shows an effective removal of uh, multiple infl inflammatory mediators and can improve oxygen, oxygen generation, stabilizing the hemodynamic status and reduce ICU stay and improve the mortality rate. So uh, further, we intended to perform 
a multi-center cohort study to investigate the efficacy and safety of hemabsorption therapy using the, this cartridge in critically ill patients with COVID-19. Uh, that would be my last part. Uh, but this this uh, is, is still unpublished data, and uh, this study will uh, was were performed in the February, actually. Here is a, is a flow diagram of the study. Uh, we, uh, a total of 71 patients were screened, uh, and 23 patients were, uh, were, 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 uh, who did not meet inclusion criteria or refused to participate or, or with the oxygen therapy uh, uh, with FiO2 of less than 30% were excluded. And one patient in control group was further excluded from uh, analysis because he died in less than 48 hours and, uh, and his intervention was discontinued. Uh, all sequential patients admitted to ICUs of uh, the, the, the two research centers were recruited within 24 hours. Uh, patients included in both groups received standard conventional treatment according to the guideline of, for COVID-19 by uh, National Health Commission of China. Uh, additionally, the uh, patient in the HA group underwent HA type um, hemoperfusion once every 24 hours for three consecutive days. Uh, each hemoperfusion uh, session lasts for three hours. Uh, respiratory parameters and laboratory testing, including a cytokine and several safety markers like total white, uh, white blood cell, uh, he, hemoglobin, platelet, INR, and D-dimer were performed at the baseline and before second, third treatment session, and 24 hours after the third session. The clinical measures, including a patch two, and the pneumonia severity index were determined uh, on the baseline in 24 hours, uh, 22 hours. Uh, the primary and secondary endpoints were evaluated on day 28. Uh, in the study, uh, we used the uh, H380 cartridge for HA treatment. Uh, and here are some results of this study. First, uh, firstly, we found a significant decrease of the um, cytokine after HA treatment uh, during, especially during the first 24 hours. Uh, actually, these cytokines in both groups decreased because uh, uh, the, the conventional treatment, uh, especially the use of corticosteroids may reduce those cytokines either. But uh, the decline slope uh, of those cytokines were a steeper in the HA group than in the control group, as the picture shows. Uh, also, we see a significant increase of uh, oxygenation parameters like PaO2 and oxygenation index. Uh, here again, with a steeper slope in the increase curve. And the disease severity scores, uh, in this study, we choose the Apache 2 score and pneumonia severity index for evaluation of disease severity and progression. Uh, we found both two scores were significantly improved in the HA group, either compared to baseline O compared to the control. Uh, the most important finding of this study was that the multi-varieties analysis suggested uh, mortality rate could be reduced by HA treatment, uh, whereas the time, a time interval between symptom, symptom onset to admission and serum ALT level on admission were uh, two independently asso association, associated with deaths. Also, the uh, mortality in HA group was uh, about it was one uh, fifteen point four percent, which uh, significantly lower than in the control group uh, at forty seven point six percent. 
Uh, here we can see here uh, HK group had a longer ICU free days uh, with the control group. Uh, we also know, uh, I like to talk about something about the ECMO, the uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, this uh, technique may have a role uh, in those COVID-19 patients uh, with uh, critical condition, but there was and always will be a significant regional difference uh, in access to medical care, which I mean due, due to the lack of a well-trained ECMO team or insufficient ECMO equipment, those patients may probably die, die in other centers. So in this study, we, we specially listed a combined calculation of fatality case and cases requiring ECMO support as an endpoint. And this incident is also significantly uh, decreased in the HA group compared to the control. Uh, for safety, none of the patients in the group developed uh, the in addition, HA uh, grew, uh, HA treatment showed no significant difference in the incidence of safety measures, including total white blood cell, uh, hemoglobin, platelet, INR, or D dimer. So, in conclusion, uh, our findings suggested that uh, this consecutive treatment of HA type hemoperfusion contribute to the reduction in disease severity. And the most likely explanation is that the pathological change in pulmonary edema and highline membrane formation in COVID-19 patients were due to uh, the activation of a pulmonary mm, uh, macrophages or other cells. Uh, absorption of HA reason uh, effectively elevated the activation of uh, local inflammatory cells by removal of cytokine circulation. Uh, this result reports hypothesis that uh, measurement of the uh, circulating cytokines levels appear to be uh, used not only for predicting inflammation status, but also for evaluating therapeutic effect in the patient with COVID-19. And in the end, we can say that uh, to date, there's still no antiviral or any other targeted therapy being proved for COVID-19. And that means support therapies, especially organ support for critically uh, ill patients, still the key point of management of COVID-19. Blood purification, in addition to the oxygenation uh, support, are the main organ support methods we have. And the HA type hemoperfusion may have a place in the treatment of critically ill patients with COVID-19. It can uh, help rectify hypoxemia, reduce disease severity scores, and significantly improve the ICU outcomes. Uh, that's all. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Liang Yu. We really enjoyed that. Um, everyone's attention is really on COVID-19 right now. And we really look to China to help us with your vast experience. Um, I would now like to welcome uh, to speak for us, Professor Erdal Kurtoglu. He's a founder and head of the Department of Hematology and head of of the Bone Marrow Center and the Thalassemia Center in Antalya Education and Research Hospital of Health Sciences University in Istanbul, Turkey. And uh, he will talk to us about his own experience on hemoperfusion, a promising therapy in improving the overall outcomes of COVID-19 critically ill uh, patients. Professor Kurtoglu, please. There you are. Oh. 
Oh, we can't hear you, Professor um, Cortog, just, you, but see you. Oh, there you go. Just a moment. Okay, I am here. Okay, we see your slides. Yes, I am here. I am starting. Yes, welcome. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I thank the organizers to invite me to this uh, webinar. I will uh, talk about our experience uh, usage of HI. 330 column in intensive care units patients uh, with COVID-19 in Turkey. Uh, in Turkey, uh, at time, at, uh, just uh, we have just about two uh, 100, uh, 1, 000, uh, 110 thousand uh, patients and around uh, 2,090 deaths. Uh, daily new cases in Turkey are uh, started to decrease. Uh, we have seen the peak level and uh, now we are uh, decreasing in uh, active uh, cases. We have a total death of around 2,090 uh, patients. Uh, and uh, when you compare the number of cases and the number of uh, total deaths, we have a death rate of around 2.5%. It's a very good uh, ratio when you compare it with the, uh, most of the developed countries. The reason for this uh, is uh, actually is that we started the therapy very early and we uh, hospitalized uh, most of the patients because uh, our hospitals and intensive care units have a, uh, have, uh, are uh, enough uh, about uh, hospitalization of the patients and we start early treatment so we don't see very much uh, pneumonia cases related with COVID-19. Uh, COVID-19 patients, uh, how can, why do we use extracorporeal uh, organ support? Here you see a, a publication uh, in Lancet in 2020, it's a new publication. Here it says that uh, these patients uh, develop a severe immune response that may be uh, increase the severity through a generalized inflammatory status. And this uh, immune regulation can lead to progressive cascade of pathophysiological events leading to critical illness with multiple organ dysfunction and death of the uh, person. As uh, the previous uh, speakers told about the background and the pathophysiology of uh, hemoporphysion for uh, COVID-19, but I will uh, just uh, repeat briefly. Uh, viral infection most of the time uh, affects lungs and uh, causes pneumonia. Pneumonia is a critical uh, problem and it needs uh, me mechanical uh, ventilation. And at that time, because of uh, overstimulation of the immune system, mediators, pro-inflammatory mediators like interleukin-1, TNF, alpha, and interleukin-6 increase, and this is called cytokine storm. Uh, because of this cytokine storm, endothelial dysfunction, shock, and organ failure are uh, coming. If uh, we uh, intervene uh, with this cytokine storm, we can uh, save these people, because uh, TNF, alpha, interleukin-6 and uh, interleukin-1 uh, are removed from the circulation by uh, way of uh, extracorporeal uh, perfusion and endothelial protection and uh, you can uh, support organs and uh, pa patient can uh, uh, become uh, normal. Hemoperfusion is an extracorporeal blood purification modality 
that consists of the passage of anticoagulated whole blood through a device, usually a column, that contains absorbed particles. Hemoperfusion is used for the removal of toxins in the case of poisoning at the beginning, but now has been used for the removal of cytokines in septic patients. Especially septic patients, when uh, use this uh, device, can show improvement hemodynamically and respiratorily. There are some uh, animal studies uh, that uh, base on this uh, device. In one of them, effect of uh, HA3 or resin directed hemoabsorption on a porcine acute respiratory distress syndrome model. In this uh, study, 24 pigs were uh, allocated into saline group receiving intravenous infusion of saline. Uh, they are six in number. An endotoxin group receiving intravenous infusion of LPS. Uh, they are also uh, 18 in number. When the ALI model was initially diagnosed, six pigs in LPS and saline group were killed for histopathological analysis. And the remaining 12 pigs in the LPS group received trial hemoabsorption or uh, another group hemoabsorption sham uh, treatment respectively and they were followed for our uh, about the situation. The result is that uh, all uh, patients with uh, all uh, animals with uh, LPS plus HM uh, treated group uh, showed improvement in oxygenation PO2 uh, levels and uh, their all oxygenation values are much better than the LPS or plus HA sham group. This shows the beneficial effect of the hemabsorption. Another animal, this animal study indicates that HA treatment significantly improved injured oxygenation induced by LPS. Also, HA also partially improved the barrier permeability and reduced lung edema and inflammation induced by LPS infusion. And third, proteomic uh, <coughs> analysis showed the differentially expressed proteins between HA and HHM treated groups mostly belong to the categories of acute inflammation and immune response and proteolysis. Also, another uh, study showed uh, that uh, with humans, effect on extrapulmonary sepsis induced acute lung injury by hemophorphysion with neutral microphoris resin column. This is a study held in uh, human being, and there are 46 uh, people, 25 are in uh, HP group and 21 in control group. Control group had a standard therapy, included fluid resuscitation, vasopressin, antimicrobial, ventilatory therapies, and so on. And the other HP group, HP once a day for three consecutive days after admission to the intensive care unit, uh, together with standard therapy. And cytokines, organ function, survival uh, are the uh, follow-up parameters for 24 days. This uh, shows that on day one, day three, and day uh, seven, it's uh, obvious that uh, the HA uh, group uh, showed improved oxygenation function and hemodynamic functions. In our, exp uh, 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 in our experience, uh, we use um, heparin, uh, but in some centers uh, can use citrate for anticoagulation. Anticoagulation is uh, very important. If you don't uh, do anticoagulation, you cannot uh, perform the uh, intervention and you cannot uh, work the machine. Heparin requirements are likely to exceed that necessary for hemodialysis due to heparin absorption. So you have, so you have to be careful. If you uh, decrease the level of uh, heparin, you are faced with uh, unexpected thrombosis uh, conditions. If you increase the dose of heparin, you are faced with unexpected bleeding conditions. Most of the time, catheters are uh, affected because of uh, this uh, condition. Uh, actually, ACT uh, should be maintained at approximately 2 to 25 times normal or an APTT of approximately 7, uh, 6 to, to uh, 7 to, uh, percent uh, seconds. 
uh, optimal blood flow uh, should be about 300 milliliter per minute, but you can increase up to 450 milliliter uh, per minute. And you should perform uh, this uh, application uh, approximately for four hours, not more than four hours, because for longer perfusions, column is saturated and you cannot uh, absorb uh, unwanted uh, materials at all. So you don't, uh, I, uh, we advise not to use more than four hours. Because of COVID 19, uh, in our uh, center, we had some uh, patients uh, needing extracorporeal uh, intervention. They are, they, these are five males and two females. They are aged ranged from 52 to 60, 86, and uh, median intervention number is five. Three to eight interventions uh, were uh, performed, and we uh, had three recoveries, uh, and they had five or uh, eight interventions. Uh, two patients had uh, five uh, interventions, and one uh, patient had eight uh, interventions. The important points, uh, as I uh, observed, age uh, is important. If uh, the age is uh, below 60, uh, you got uh, much better uh, results. And interleukin levels are important. Uh, we measured interleukin levels uh, in this study, but uh, I <coughs> couldn't reach all uh, data because they were uh, they are uh, followed in intensive care unit. In uh, coming days, we will get the uh, actual uh, interleukin levels and the other parameters uh, of the patients. Uh, the more, uh, but uh, you cannot. <coughs> uh, it's not compulsory that you, you have to measure interleukin levels. Uh, if you suspect uh, there is a cytokine storm, you can perform this uh, method. But another important point is that as uh, you perform uh, as early as uh, uh, if you perform this uh, procedure very early, you got much better results. If patient uh, is on mechanical ventilation, results are not uh, much good. Also, coagulation problems can occur. Uh, we, in one patient, uh, we had uh, <coughs> three catheter uh, removal. When you put the catheter, uh, it's just obliterated uh, quickly, and because of this, we couldn't uh, perform uh, procedure, and we had to change uh, catheter uh, three times. So uh, you have to be uh, careful uh, about these problems. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Toglu. Uh, we'd like to now open the some discussion points. Uh, we see that really there was organ crosstalk in all these diseases, whether it's leptospirosis or COVID-19. Uh, we have patients with multiple organ failure, the kidney, the liver, and uh, so many other uh, organs that are um, disrupted because of these severe diseases. Um, a very important point that uh, always um, crops up is when to start hemoperfusion. We all know that it has a very uh, positive role in uh, removing cytokines, but when do we intervene? Um, can I ask uh, Professor Yu and Professor Kortoglu their thoughts about this? When exactly uh, should you start hemoperfusion? Professor Yu? Yes, uh, actually, uh, my, my opinion uh, for patients with COVID-19 is uh, the, the purpose of using uh, uh, hemoabsorption uh, is to remove the inflammatory mediator from circulation. Uh, kept them uh, in a low level uh, within the scope of compensation. Uh, so so the, the start of uh, uh, HA treatment should not be determined by uh, whether there is an AKI. Uh, once we found a patient with a rapidly progressed lung lesion or uh, persistently elevated uh, serum cytokines, uh, then we started the treatment. Uh, uh, there, there was actually an expert consensus on the application of artificial liver blood purification system in the 
treatment of severe and critically COVID-19, which is already uh, published in a journal called uh, Infectious Microbes and uh, Disease. Uh, if, if, if anyone is interested, you can uh, search this article. Uh, uh, and you, you can also contact me by email. Yeah, that's it. When um, you have prog rapidly progressing lung lesions, then you intervene already. No need to measure any of the markers. You, you just um, the, the only marker uh, uh, I said, uh, preferred is the cytokine, if you can test it. Right. Um, what about the PF ratios? Is that important as well as a marker of severity of lung disease? Uh, maybe, I, but, but, but we, we don't use this as a, a good marker, actually. I see. Uh, Professor Kurtoglu, when do you feel that uh, we should initiate hemoperfusion? If uh, the patient has uh, tachypnea or uh, dyspnea, uh, in this case, uh, we have to think about uh, hemoperfusion because uh, if, you, uh, if you are late uh, about hemoperfusion, in coming days, patients uh, may need uh, mechanical ventilation. If uh, he or she is on mechanical ventilation, uh, the problem is uh, getting worse. So uh, in our center, uh, we, perf uh, we prefer uh, to uh, take this uh, procedure as early as possible. If the patient uh, as a symptom has dyspnea or tachypnea, it's a criteria. Or the second criteria is the thorax or uh, lung CT of the patient. Uh, in Turkey, uh, we are lucky that we can uh, perform uh, lung CT uh, for uh, any patients. So uh, if you see lesions uh, specific for COVID-19 on uh, lung uh, scanning, then uh, after that, uh, the patient has symptoms like tachypnea, dyspnea, uh, it's necessary to perform this procedure. Uh, if uh, you ask about the cytokine levels, uh, it may be, it may be or may not be. If you have a uh, laboratory that are working for interleukin or other cytokines, it's okay. But if you don't have, uh, it's okay. Uh, you can uh, perform the procedure without looking the levels of uh, cytokines. So it's really the clinical condition of the patient that's really very important. Yes. Uh, right. Uh, do you wait for uh, like um, hypotension or you know cardiovascular um, deterioration, or this is any late a late uh, parameter, Professor Yu? A low pressure. Would that be too late already before? starting hemoperfusion for you? Professor Yu? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, 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 if the patient uh, has already high po low blood pressure, would yeah. that be a late sign for you to start hemoperfusion? Would you start it oh. much earlier before the patient develops low blood pressure? Yeah, we will start uh, before the uh, low pressure happens. Uh, actually, uh, the the uh, uh, the shock is not a uh, exclude exclude Croatia for our study. Uh, um, so, so, or and I uh, in our center we we don't have so much patient with shock. Uh, 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 in critically patient uh, in ICUs with COVID-19. It's not a common uh, uh, complication as I, as I ob observed. All right. Maybe later uh, when, when they have bacterial co-infection, the, the, uh, this complication would be common. I see. Uh, let's go to another uh, discussion point. Um, what would be your choice of extracorporeal organ support for these patients? Uh, Professor Yu, you mentioned uh, you put the patients on artificial liver support system. Can you tell us more about that? 
Yeah, oh, it's just a technique for uh, it can perform multiple uh, uh, blood purification therapies. Uh, and in our study, we only choose uh, to use uh, hemoperfusion, use a HA type cartridge. Uh, actually, uh, uh, on 19, uh, 2017, the epidemic, uh, the epidemic of H7N9 uh, influenza, we uh, performed a a clinical trial using uh, plasma exchange for those critically patients. And but, uh, uh, in China, the uh, blood source is always a problem. So uh, this time we, we, uh, we uh, change it to the hemoperfusion. <laughs> uh, uh, the plasma exchange mm, could, may could be better, but uh, uh, the, the key point is that blood source is limited. Yeah. All right. And Professor Kurtoglu, what do you feel about extracorporeal organ support? We performed uh, hemoperfusion, uh, but uh, we couldn't uh, prefer any uh, device for a uh, liver function. We just used uh, hemoperfusion. But uh, if uh, you have a problem with uh, liver, uh, it can be uh, taken uh, into account. But uh, our uh, patients uh, have uh, good uh, liver uh, functions, so we did not perf uh, prefer uh, this approach. Another point is that uh, I think uh, plasma pheresis is also necessary. If you don't have a hemoperfusion uh, device or materials, uh, normal plasma pheresis uh, can be effective especially for patients uh, who have uh, DIC uh, or uh, hemodynamic uh, problems. I think uh, especially for patients with coagulation problems, uh, total plasma exchange uh, can be another choice. I uh, tried in one patient, but uh, patient is in a terminal position, so uh, I cannot uh, say that it's uh, okay or not uh, in, this patient, in that patient. Oh, can we talk a little about um, anticoagulation? Uh, we know that in COVID, um, there's a lot of uh, discussions on the role of D-dimer, that it means that um, the disease causes a lot of thrombosis. Um, Professor Yu, do you uh, routinely anticoagulate these patients? Yeah, I routinely uh, uh, anticoagulate these patients. So, so but, you uh, would... Mm. Would you give low molecular weight heparin daily, or how would you anticoagulate these patients? We use uh, uh, how how to do that? <laughs> so you give daily anticoagulation daily, for the yeah daily yeah for every patient, okay. not only and for this uh, hemo uh, blood purification patient, yeah. all patients. And Professor Kurtoglu, do you also anticoagulate the, the COVID-19 patients? Uh, I don't uh, follow up these patients in the world because uh, I am a hematologist. Uh, they are followed in intensive uh, care units doctors or uh, infectious disease doctors. But uh, in uh, case of uh, COVID-19 patients with uh, hemoperfusion, we use anticoagulation with uh, heparin. Uh, heparin uh, uh, is important because unexpected uh, thrombosis or uh, especially bleeding can happen in these patients. And I think uh, these patients have uh, typical uh, DIC patients, I think. Uh, and we can, uh, we should approach these patients uh, like uh, DIC patients because COVID-19 is an infectious disease and it can uh, cause uh, DIC as uh, other infections uh, do. Uh, Professor Yu, um, do you feel that the pathophysiology here in the lung is mostly thrombos um, thrombosis? Uh, that's why you uh, routinely give anticoagulation? There's a lot of talk Yes. Actually, according to the um, guideline for critically ill patients for COVID-19 in China, uh, this uh, suggested to use anticoagulation therapies to 
against thrombocytosis in the lung, the micro thrombocyte in the lung, actually. The so we, 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 we did uh, uh, anti-coagulations uh, for every patient in the ICU. And how long do you do this? How, long, how many days um, do you give the anticoagulation? Uh, after they recovered and discharged from ICU, maybe uh, they were determined by uh, the DVT uh, measures okay. so later. In, that's it. Okay. Um, let's look at some more discussion points. Um, we mentioned that um, sometimes when you do your biomarkers, we find that um, they rebound after the hemoperfusion. Um, Professor Yu, do you, what do you do about that? Why do you think that happens? Well, uh, actually in my study, is the condition of most patient uh, in HA group uh, continues to improve uh, without rebound. Uh, uh, while in some patients, uh, the rebound of cytokines could be observed after the HA treatment. But uh, uh, as I men mentioned in the presentation, uh, cytokines in both groups uh, had decreased. And this kind of rebound uh, could be observed in control group as well. So, so I think this uh, rebound is uh, more likely uh, to, to uh, related with uh, other conditions like um, bacterial infection uh, or uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the other com complications. So uh, uh, there could be uh, various uh, clinical conditions after that. So uh, my solution is to, uh, to use antibody, uh, antibiotic uh, uh, schedule uh, 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 culture if you suspect a bacterial co-infection. If not, uh, the, there must be something happened. Just find it out. Right. Yeah. Now, Professor Toglu, what do you feel about this? Do you observe that the inflammatory markers sometimes have a rebound after hyperperfusion? Do you do anything about it? I, I haven't observed uh, such elevation in my patients, but uh, I also think that uh, this may be not uh, due to COVID-19, but due to other uh, infections uh, added uh, to the uh, situation but not uh, due to COVID, I think. All right. Uh, can we take maybe some questions from the audience? Um, can I ask the two professors? Um, another treatment that seems to be popular for COVID-19 is tocilizumab, which is an IL-6 uh, inhibitor. Do, would you use that? Professor Yu and Professor Kurtoglu, is it part of your protocol as well? Yes, uh, it is uh, part of our protocol. But uh, as I said, uh, our uh, doctors uh, working in uh, intensive care unit are using it. It blocks the mechanisms of uh, interleukin. So it may, uh, after uh, tocilizumab, uh, when you perform uh, hemoabsorption, uh, it must be uh, it's better than uh, without using tocilizumab, but uh, it's uh, used in uh, our country also. So do you use it um, at the same time or would you use one and if it fails, then you use uh, no, the other? We, uh, we use together uh, first uh, tocilizumab, then uh, perform uh, hem absorption uh, of the uh, cytokines. And uh, why do you use that? Why do you use it sequentially? Is it because tocilizumab only removes IL-6 and so you have the hemoperfusion to remove other cytokines? Uh, yes. What is the reason for the sequential use of the two? Yes, uh, it decreases the uh, production of interleukins, but there are other uh, cytokines and uh, previously maybe produced interleukins may be present before the blockage so uh, we can remove and uh, purify the bloodstream. 
I see. Professor Yu, how do you uh, use um, tocilizumab um, to uh, get chemoperfusion? perfusion? Yeah, actually, we uh, we don't use this one because the it's a monoclonal antibody against the uh, interleukin six receptor. Uh, yeah. So, uh, to use this uh, drugs only uh, reduce the level of uh, uh, the certain level of uh, interleukin six, uh, and may cause uh, uh, may cause the accumulation of circulating. Uh, interleukin six, it, it 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 will bind the receptor and make the circulating interleukin six uh, higher accumulated. So okay. uh, just, uh, and moreover, uh, uh, with this consistent dis uh, uh, inconsistent distribution of interleukin six receptor in the tissue, the this kind of elevated circulating. Uh, interleukin six may uh, affect more organs, actually. Uh, so, so it's uh, not part uh, of the protocol in China. Yeah, it's not part of the protocol. There are ch clinical trials about this, but uh, the uh, uh, as I know, the the result is not very good, actually. I see. Okay. Um, let's look at some of the other questions uh, that our audience is sending to us. Um, a, another question is, uh, when do we stop hemoperfusion? We have a lot of protocols. Mostly we do three or four doses, then stop. Um, what tells us to stop or what would tell us uh, we need another dose? Uh, what do you feel about this, Professor Yu? Yeah, uh, uh, as I mentioned, there was an um, expert consensus uh, of uh, the application of uh, blood purification uh, for those COVID-19 patients, and they indicate a uh, elevated level of interleukin-6 of more than five-fold would be a, a start point. And uh, if, if you cannot test the cytokines, you can use uh, the uh, CRP or uh, ferritin or uh, you you can uh, compare the, uh, the 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 land lesion progressed. Yeah, that that would be a, a start time for you to decide. I see, Professor Kurtoglu, what do you feel about this? I think at least uh, you should perform three applications at least. I think. Uh, then uh, you, you should follow the parameters uh, like hemodynamics, oxygenation. If patient in on, uh, is on mechanical ventilation, there may be uh, some improvement uh, about the parameters. Or uh, if you follow uh, patients' uh, interleukin levels, it may be another indicator. But if you don't have uh, any intervention like uh, laboratory uh, results, uh, I think the most important thing uh, is the uh, clinical progression, clinical development of the patient. Uh, so if you got uh, some uh, good uh, results, then you can increase the uh, number of intervention up to five. I see. Uh, Professor Yu, one of the audience is asking, is viral load measurement important to, uh, to do uh, before or after doing hemoperfusion? Do you think that matters, the viral load? No, uh, actually, uh, we, we don't think this is a good indicator for these uh, therapies. Uh, and in uh, our center, we uh, observed some patients may have a very, very long uh, viral uh, positive time. That could be more than 40 days. Uh, and that was uh, uh, associated with the, um, uh, the, the subtype of these virus. Uh, we, we already uh, analyzed this and, and, and uh, it's still uh, under publication. 
Okay, so, so the, uh, we, we don't think the viral load uh, would be an indicator for these kind of therapies or any kind uh, of therapy. Actually. As you showed and as seen globally, a majority of the patients with COVID-19 get better. I mean, in your own series, like I think 80% got better, but there'll be 20% who will have severe disease. What makes some patients do better and some uh, do very badly? Is it the viral load or the, the immune response of the patient? Uh, actually, we still don't know how and why. Yeah. Professor Cortoglu, do you have anything, thoughts about that? I think viral load is important. If you got uh, very much uh, virus, uh, it's uh, difficult to eliminate from the body, theoretically. Another point, uh, immune system is important. You don't have uh, chronic disease like uh, heart disease, lung disease, or oncological, hematological malignancy. Maybe you don't have any of this, but uh, your uh, immunologic status somewhat is in uh, problem at that uh, time. Uh, you can uh, have a problem with the uh, COVID-19 infection. Viral load, uh, I think, is important, uh, should be investigated. Immune system is uh, also uh, important. And uh, comorbid uh, diseases are uh, important. But uh, many times we see that uh, a patient uh, with no problem, in good health position, at uh, age of 20 or 30, uh, are dying uh, from COVID-19. In these cases, uh, we cannot answer what's the problem. Very nice. Professor Kurtogl, I think uh, this question is for you. Will markers like von Willebrand factor and ADAPS 13 be markers for endothelial activation? Do they have a role here? I don't know, actually, since uh, we don't uh, measure these uh, parameters. But uh, they are, uh, especially the von factor is uh, important for uh, coagulation uh, cascade. But uh, we couldn't uh, measure uh, these both factors, especially uh, Adams uh, 13 is also, uh, we couldn't measure this. But uh, the role uh, should be investigated. I see. Uh, Professor um, Yu, um, those patients whom you did ECMO, do you do VV ECMO or do you do VA ECMO? Well, for patients with no uh, uh, cardio uh, problem, we use VV ECMO. But with uh, 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 the lesion, uh, with, with uh, heart, heart uh, disease or have uh, a hard problem, it could, we may use VA for more uh, cardiac support. And um, what is the average length of ECMO uh, for those patients who you were uh, successful in putting them on ECMO? How, how long did they usually stay on ECMO? About, uh, the average is about two weeks, two weeks. In our center, actually, I yes. don't know uh, in the other center what what's the situation. All right. Uh, let's see. What about the use of antiviral drugs? Um, do, do you routinely give it um, in these patients, Professor Yu? Yes, we routinely give antiviral drugs according to the uh, guideline of our country, but. Actually, they, it's used it as no, it's no antiviral drug has uh, been, been effective. Yeah. Right. What about you, Professor Kurtoglu? Um, are antivirals uh, part of your treatment protocol in Turkey? As I said, uh, yes, in Turkey, uh, we use uh, antiviral drugs. Yes. yes. But uh, as I said, I, I am not following these patients in the work, just uh, on consultation intensive care unit for uh, hemoprofusion or so, but I know that uh, we use hydroxychloroquine and uh, antiviral drugs. All right. 
Um, I think we're winding up our discussion. We have like two minutes to go. Um, I'd like to invite our two professors to give some uh, remarks about uh, what uh, really they learned about this illness and what they could share with everybody as to how to uh, treat it as uh, the best way we can. Let's start with Professor Kurtoglu. It's a complex disease. It affects many organs. But uh, I think the most important thing is the early diagnosis and uh, early identification of the patient and uh, early hospitalization of the patient to uh, start uh, drugs. And uh, we have to prevent uh, pneumonia. Uh, we have to save the lungs. Uh, if uh, there is a pneumonia, in that case, uh, if you need hemoperfusion, you should start as early as possible as uh, the patient has some problems with his or her breath, like dyspnea, tachypnea. If in that condition, uh, you should start uh, early intervention with hemoperfusion. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Yu? Yeah, um, uh, as I just mentioned, the, uh, in our study, we found uh, the time interval between symptom onset and admission as independently associated with death. So, um, uh, like uh, Professor uh, Kutogru said, the key point is to early diagnosis and early support treatment for those patients. Uh, that's my opinion. Thank you. Um, so we have uh, here another option uh, of therapy in treating devastating diseases. On the one hand, we have leptospirosis, a bacterial infection. We have COVID-19, a viral infection. Both can cause very severe uh, lung hemorrhage, lung disease, um, and sepsis. Uh, we have hemoperfusion as a very important therapy that we may use. Um, we've seen, we've heard both professors uh, give the pros and cons of tocilizumab. Uh, one may be not very effective and our other uh, speakers saying that there may be a role even for sequential therapy for tocilizumab and uh, hemoperfusion. We all have seen from the two presenters that hemoperfusion is a safe therapy. They saw very few adverse events. It does require monitoring. Uh, we have Professor Kortoglu, very practical. Uh, no need for markers. Uh, the clinical presentation is very important. And for Professor Yu, with his vast experience in China, showing to us also the deterioration in lung function, these clinical parameters are so important. Um, and uh, lastly, early therapy, again, is the most important, uh, very essential to save these patients. Early diagnosis and early treatment and uh, we really are very happy that we have hemoperfusion as a part of therapy and it's found to be effective, in, at least in all the cases that we've seen. There uh, will be uh, increasing publications on the use of this important um, modality. Uh, in addition to uh, dialysis, renal replacement, uh, there is a role uh, for hemoperfusion. So I would like to thank our guest speakers, Professor Yu and Professor Kurtoglu. Thank you for sharing uh, your evening with us. And um, thank you all to the audience. Thank they you. were very participative. There are a lot of questions actually that they sent to us. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll have another um, series in this, uh, um, in, in this webinar for us to learn more about the diseases that are affecting us um, now and that the role that hemoperfusion can play. Thank you so much to the audience and to our very important speakers. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor Dengler. Bye. 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 Thank you.